The Royal Society is one of the oldest and most prestigious scientific societies in the world. It was founded on the 28th of November 1660 by a group of 12 natural philosophers including Robert Boyle. The Society is celebrating its 350th anniversary this year and I'm pleased to be joined by the current president and the Cambridge University cosmologist Martin Rees. Martin, thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Um, the first question is, in an age of Twitter and Facebook and the internet, What's the point of an admittedly uh, elitist scientific society such as the Royal Society? I'd say it's more important now than ever because it's important to disseminate science and its discoveries worldwide, not just within its nation, using all possible techniques. But we do many other things as well. We promote science education, we promote international exchange in science, and we concern ourselves very much with policy questions. And of course there are more and more policy questions which have a scientific dimension. Uh, be it um, energy, health, climate and many others. And so we try and ensure that we have discussions among the best scientists from the UK and internationally and that we, whenever possible, try to provide the best advice to governments and other policy makers. I know that you and your predecessor, um, Lord May, have tried to increase the amount of um, scientific advice given to politicians. Um, has that change of attitude worked? I hope so. I would hope that uh, our reports have an impact and end up on the right desks in Whitehall. And within the last few months, we've produced reports on a number of important questions, um, how to enhance food production using modern techniques, geoengineering, biosecurity, education, and many other topics. So we hope very much that these reports do have an influence. And we've hosted also meetings on topics like biodiversity, during the last few months. So all these are questions where we need scientific input into policy making. I know you're working and you and your colleagues are working on a new report on the future of UK science. Can you tell us anything about what that will recommend? Yes, well I think the main motive behind that is that the UK has a strong tradition in science. We are by most uh, criteria number one or two in the world in most areas of science. We're the only country outside the US that has several universities in the top part of the league table and it's very important that we stay that way and also that we ensure that this uh, scientific strength is used to the benefit of uh, UK society and the UK economy. And so what we're doing in this report is um, trying to gather the advice from a strong committee and the committee preparing the report includes two former science ministers, two Nobel Prize winners, people from industry and academia and we're trying to address what problems face this country and how we can optimise our prospects for the next uh, five or ten years or even twenty years, taking advantage of what we have succeeded in doing already and making sure we don't lose our momentum because there are tremendous opportunities for this country and we need to ensure that uh, we maintain our standing in a world where there is greater competition from elsewhere. And if I could turn to your interest in astronomy, I know that uh, the last 12 months have seen some very exciting results, um, mm. new data from the Fermi telescope and the launch of the European Space Agency's Planck satellite. What, mm. in your view, are the most interesting astronomy developments over the next few years? Well, it's certainly an exciting time. I think uh, we will see a lot of results from the uh, um, searches for planets around other stars. The Kepler spacecraft is going to, within two years, tell us how many planets rather like the Earth there are, planets the size of the Earth, orbiting stars like the Sun at a distance such that water can exist. So that's a very exciting area in the subject. Also, from the uh, Planck and Herschel spacecraft, which are of course European ventures, we're going to learn a great deal more about uh, how the universe evolved from its mysterious beginnings to its present state. The Planck satellite is probing the very early stages, the microwave background radiation and the fluctuations present in the early universe, and the Herschel spacecraft is doing many studies in infrared astronomy, but the ones of closest interest to me are trying to understand how the very first galaxies formed and when in the universe the first structures formed and, as it were, lit up the universe after a dark age. 
And what do you think about President Obama's recent decision to uh, not return astronauts to the moon? <clears throat> well, I think given the financial constraints, if I was an American taxpayer, I would entirely support it. I think it's very important that we pursue science in space, all the applications of space, and pursue miniaturization and robotics. And I think the uh, case for sending people into space is getting weaker all the time with every advance in uh, robotics and miniaturization. I still believe in the long run that there is a role for people in space, but that's just as an adventure, not for any practical purpose. So I think when the costs come down, I hope one day people will go to Mars and walk on Mars. I hope some people now living will walk on Mars, but I think the um, American space program uh, is now uh, on a good direction, and I hope very much that Europe can uh, emphasize unmanned spacecraft, because uh, we in Europe don't have the same budget as NASA. But if we focus entirely on unmanned space exploration, we can get a lead over NASA in Europe, just as our particle physicists have got a world lead in CERN. And in addition to being president of the Royal Society, also master of Trinity College and astronomer Royal, how do you find time to juggle your different responsibilities? Well, we're difficult to, but certainly I'm in a style of life which is fascinating, and I enjoy both my own science and understanding policy questions and also the communication of science because I think it's very important that uh, science is not just for scientists. It's important that uh, everyone has some feel for science because as citizens we live in a world that's ever more determined by the application of science and how science is applied should not be just decided by scientists. It's something that everyone should participate in but that debate can't be intelligent can't get above the level of slogans and tabloid journalism unless the public has a feel for science and a balanced view of risk, etc. So it's an important part of any scientist's job, not only to do their science, but to be prepared to engage with the public when their science is of practical relevance. A couple of years ago, you published a book, Our Final Century, where you made the dramatic prediction that civilization only had a 50-50 chance of surviving the next century. Are you still so pessimistic or do you have any grounds for optimism now? Well, I said surviving without some severe setback. I still think there are concerns, but I think uh, the way we can minimise the risks is by ensuring that um, politicians take advantage of the best science in making their decisions and the public is aware of the opportunities presented by science as well as the threats. Clearly, science and technology have led to some problems, but the answer to those is not to put the brakes on science, it's more science but perhaps slightly differently directed. And there are two classes of threats that I drew attention to in my book. One is the uh, threats that we are as humans collectively imposing on the earth because of the pressures we are imposing on the environment, um, the climate, energy supplies, etc. But also there's another class of threat that comes from the greater empowerment of individuals. And in our ever more interconnected world, that's a danger as well. So I hope very much that we can avoid these dangers, but we can only avoid them if people are aware of what the opportunities are and that we channel science in an optimum way and also engage with our fellow citizens in discussions of how science should be applied. Thanks very much, Martin.